Hello everybody and welcome to episode number 26 of the Biff Rugby League podcast. This is the penultimate episode of the season. This is going to be our World Cup finals preview show as well as throwing in every other bit of news that sort of has happened over the last week um, from hotel bust-ups to golden boot winners to NRL transfers. Just absolutely ridiculous. Um, But before we get into all of that, Toby, I'm going to ask you how you are because you're the happiest of the three of us this week. Yeah, I mean, I'm in a very good mood and I think part of that's obviously because, you know, as a Welshman, I'm not allowed to like watch an England win and I would have had to support England had they got to the final because it went in rugby league terms, Australia as a nation, or the Australian national team are the worst, the most toxic part of rugby league, which says a lot. Um considering other factors that try and impact the game sometimes. Um, But I think the more I reflect on it, I'm actually a very happy man, and I think all of us have to be happy men because of how good the state of the international game is, despite the fact that there's still many discrepancies to be with that need wiping out of the international game. There is, we are in a position, which I never thought we would have been in at the end of 2013, where we have five elite international teams who could have all got to the final if it was on their day. And on top of that, we have another side which aren't far away from being elite and two very reputable sides which, you know, create enough, who have enough quality to make you at least get excited for their games against these more elite nations. So I think, I think that International Rugby League, I think I'm finally seeing it after a group stage where I was very negative. I, the last two quarterfinals, the two semi-finals, I really am like positive about international rugby league, and I'll get onto it, I guess. But we really need to make sure that we keep this quality of fixture as an annual event in some form or another. But yeah, fantastic, fantastic uh, men's final that we have lined up, and fantastic women's and wheelchair finals, despite the fact Wales got absolutely pumped. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So just just a great time to be a rugby league. I think this festival of World Cups has really been fantastic. Um, yeah, really, really, really proud of all the athletes who have taken part. Yeah, hundred percent. It's I'm. It's really weird that it's only well at the time of recording the finals five days away, and then after that we're not going to have anything until like the first weekend in January when you start getting pre season fixtures and. And things like that, Robin. How how are you this week? How, are you are you sort of over the fact that we lost in that semi final yet, or are you kind of screwing at the fact that we just sort of fed the bear? Yeah, it it was painful, wasn't it? I mean, and then we followed it up with another loss on Monday night. So it's it. I think it's a shame. Like Old Trafford won't be the same without an English team there. But I'm kind of like feeling the same sort of vibes as Toby, where I'm just buzzing with this competition as a whole. I think. We've seen some like fantastic games, and I've been really lucky that most of it's been on my doorstep, and I, I've just had a great time. So it would have been the icing on the cake, but to be honest, it, it doesn't matter too much because it, it just it's just been great fun. Like, um, you know, we, we went out in in such a way that like it, even that was a, a highlight game. Like to a neutral, that would have been fantastic to watch. So if we'd have been beat sixty nil in the semi final, I, I'd be gutted. But you know. To go out against um, an elite team playing, coming up with a clutch, a clutch play like that is kind of, you know, fair and square. Yeah, definitely. Um, we may as well get in onto it. Like England looked like you, you understand they they absolutely hammered Samoa, so you can understand why there was a little bit of positivity going into the semi final, having put sixty points on them in week one. But as we were aware, <laughs> I mean, fans of rugby league were aware that Samoa side had not re- hadn't been in camp. For less than like maybe not even ten days a week, hadn't played a warm up game. Actually, no, they 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 played. I think they played one warm up game maybe, and before maybe I can't remember if it was Tonga that played France or Samoa that played France at the Shea, um, beforehand. But from what I'm aware, it was they didn't have a warm up game. They played interplay England on home soil in front of a really good crowd, and were pumped. And you we kind of expected that to happen. Everyone was like, oh, it's going to be a tough game. It wasn't. That people are coming into this going, oh, England are going to win. They're going to get to the final. It, it just, it was, it was a cracking game. Like I don't think either team necessarily deserved to lose that game, but neither. But Samoa were clearly the team that deserved to win it. 
if, if that makes sense. Yeah, Eng- England were just not um, clinical enough at that level, at that standard. They made so many mistakes and switched off. And it was weird. We've seen them like perform so well in the group stages, and they, at times they looked unstoppable. Um, but I think it was more of a case of they just hadn't come up against that challenge, and they hadn't really improved from week one because they hadn't needed to, whereas Samoa had just steadily improved, well, massively improved from week one, but you could see them growing and building, and um, the um, the introduction of, of Tim Lafay like, changed the team completely, I think. They, they sort of came, they withdrew from all the media stuff, like they just sort of, like it's been very quiet and they've just sort of like uh, knuckled down and they, they they made it show. I mean, they made history getting to the quarter, to the semis and now they've bettered it by getting to the final and what like what a massive achievement for such a tiny little place and um like like Toby was saying at the beginning, like it's great for international rugby league. As good as it is for an English fan, it's great that we've got a new team up there challenging the best and full of like genuine homegrown elite talent. Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. And like you said, Toby, at the start, it, it's it's phenomenal for the international game. You look at back in two thousand and thirteen, Samoa won two of their three group stage games. And they went into the uh, knockouts and lost twenty two four to Fiji in the quarterfinals back in twenty thirteen. You go you go to twenty seventeen, and I don't I don't believe they won many games at all in their group back in twenty seventeen. No, they didn't. They drew against Scotland and lost to New Zealand and Tonga. And what? Yeah, it was a tough group. But you look at how that team has developed since two thousand and seventeen. Unbelievably different for for that and you well, you look at the New Zealand side and there's not a lot of difference in that New Zealand side whereas you go through Samoa only Tim Lafay, Junior Paulo, Josh Papali'i are the, are the three that are in that team from when they played New Zealand back in 2017. The development of this team is absolutely crazy and I'm, I'm really positive for Samoa but we need to we, we, we'll start with England. What, what's next for England? They've not had, this is a fact, they've not had the same coach coach them at more than one World Cup so but with the World Cup only being three years away and Phil Mayne only having a year on his contract, where do you think that leaves leaves England with their coaching situation? Do they have to give Wayne the World Cup next time? Because two years is not enough for a coach to come in and implement anything, is it? Well, I uh, think... Go on, Tos. I think that Sean Wayne has to stay. I think he's a fantastic coach and he's shown right up until the semi-final how fantastic he is. And even then, I think that a lot of the people knocking England's performance, perhaps being critical of Wayne, but also being critical of certain players, are very much fans of rugby league who support their club and support their country and don't don't keep an eye on just what's happening in the NRL, just what developments are being made to the game internationally. And for them, it's hugely frustrating um, to see this England side slip away not knowing that on paper the Samoa side is the better team, does have the better players. And, yeah, I think that Sean Wayne did make a critical error in allowing his team play ex- so, so expansively out of their own half in Golden Point. Um, but I also think that, you know, he recognises that mistake and he c- coached a team who, on paper, are a worse team to an incredibly gutsy performance that saw them score some really well-worked tries to stay in that game until the 83rd minute of Golden Point or so. And I think that sort of really resonated with me, is that if that I'm not sure England under, say, Wayne Bennett, even get, get that game back to a Golden Point situation. And I think that is genuinely something that Sean Wayne has managed to breed. I think another thing that like I just want to add to that is that I don't even think that... I think the wrong players are being blamed for this, and England is a young squad that can only get better. And I think the players who are actually sort of weren't good enough to be involved in that Samoa game aren't Jack Wellsby and Sam Tompkins, but are in fact probably Callum Watkins um, and maybe like a Chris Hill or something. And I think that when you look at the players we were putting in our... You know, we were putting in our squad, 
when we were considering Zach Hardaker, Jake Connor, Ryan Sutton to just bring something different yeah. and bring something that other players wouldn't expect. And I think that the selection crisis, which Sean Wayne managed to dull down and say wasn't an issue, actually has now really come to light against Samoa, with I think sort of they're being too stagnant out of dummy half, but also they're being sort of not enough players who are just completely comfortable with throwing the ball around to play that play style. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. It was it was weird that we played better in the 15 minutes that Radley was at hooker. I don't know if this was something you were going to touch on, Robin, but the lack of Andy Akers on the bench was a, was a throw for me because his speed and the way he plays around the ruck could have exploited something that the Samoans haven't been very good at this tournament, and that is defending behind the ruck. Yeah, I was. I mean, you'll never, never reveal it, will he? But I wonder what his game plan like was. I wonder what his his masterstroke was because, to me, like, and it was working on the actors at the start mm. of the tournament. I wasn't sure about that selection, and and he did try things around. You know, like we we had a game with um, Sneed in at halfback, so he he tried his combinations, and I'd like to know why he went with the the, the team he did over the one that um, appeared to be so successful. Um, I think, despite that, I, I still think that um, Sean Wayne should stay. I mean, he didn't have a, a, a massive build-up to the World Cup with um, the lack of like international fixtures in, in the build-up. And um, I, with the news that we, we've got a, a France fixture um, not long into next year, hopefully he'll, with a, a proper run and this team, with like relatively early success, that's a young team. I think he can he can build it. I think he's really behind English rugby league, and um, I think he manages to get the best out of his players. So I think that they should stick by him. I think that it would be a mistake to try and start again. Um, but we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm. I'm totally yeah, in many ways. There. Sorry, I was just going to say, like in many ways, that his game plan in this tournament has been attacked through the second rows who are, you know, John Bateman and Elliot Whitehead are NRL quality second yeah. rows, attack through the centres who Herbie Farmworth is an NRL quality centre, and then obviously, like, get you know, get those line breaks, get up to the line, and then you've got Tom Burgess as a weapon, you've got your edges and your wingers as weapons, and I think that that's a lot more expansive than we were expecting Sean Wayne to play, and I think that partially that is because he knew that when he came up against bigger packs, England's pack perhaps couldn't match up to them, and I think what's really happened is that expect you know you get to, you get they put a really gutsy performance in that game tactic has done really well to put to put the amount of points on Samoa that it did, and then you've just reached a situation where in Golden Point, which I don't I'm not sure if Sean Wayne was still the Wigan coach when Golden Point came into Super League. No, I don't think it was. So he's probably never been in a Golden Point situation before, and I think that's something that only experience can teach you that. You have to really just knuckle down, make the hard meters, and make and put field position first. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, you look at some of the stats just from games played and points and everything else. You look at halves. Jack Wellesby's played four games for England. Um, he's only scored four points. Mark Sneed's played two games for England, and he's offered a little bit more. He's he's got the try with four points, but he's also kicked ten goals. Like so, he, Wellsby really, like you said, he's might, maybe not to blame, but he's he's a young player. The stage might have been a little bit too big for him, but we can build around him. Victor Radley coming into an England camp for the first time, he's never played with any of these other players. He played against them, but he's never played with any of these other players. Um, young lads like Kai Pierce, Paul, Joe Batchelor, Nikolai Levski, they're lads that are going to be in and around this squad for a long, long time. Players that we know are not going to be at the next World Cup. You're probably looking at Ryan Hall, Chris Hill. Watkins, Burgess, Tompkins, Whitehead, those those five players there, are, maybe not Whitehead, but you're looking at, well, he's 33, so yeah, probably looking at Whitehead as well. You look at these guys that have all played big test games for for England, all over the age of 30, there, there's, there's needs to be. Ryan Hall's played 45 times for England. Like he's, not, he's probably not going to play again. George Williams is still young enough. You're going to be 28 years old. He's probably coming into the prime of his career. He needs to really kick on now. Like in terms of personnel, who who stays in this team for you for for the, the in the next three years? Who has to stay in this team, no matter what form they're in? Who do you have to build this team around? 
Well, I think Dom Young's got to, his name's got to be thrown in the ring because he just exploded, didn't he? And um, I think I think it, it's kind of a bit like Ryan Hall when when he first came on the scene and like instantly like the Australians respected him and on the international um, scene he was kind of feared a little bit. And I think that Dom Young's maybe replicating that a little bit, which which is really helpful. And the fact that he's still over in the NRL means, like, fingers crossed, he can only get better. And another player that has been really impressive and um, kept England in, in the game against Samoa was um, Herbie Farnworth. And oh, we, when we very first, in the very earliest days of the Biff, we were talking about England squads and we weren't quite sure if he was ready. He was just sort of a maybe if somebody gets injured. But I think he's, since then, he's improved so much and he's definitely become a, a key player of the England side. Yeah, definitely. I mean, four four games, three tries for, for England in the World Cup. Like he's, he's still only 22 years of age. The, the try he scored, I think it was his first try at the weekend, where he powered through four or five of Samoans. And we know they're not, obviously, people can tackle at this level, but just because they can tackle doesn't mean they're necessarily strong tackles. These Samoan tackles are going to be unbelievably powerful to get through he busts through four of them and scores and it really just makes England realise that actually yeah we can win this game if we play properly but into the last 20 minutes of that game once McLaurin came back on it just seemed to be it just seemed to be there just seemed to be no structure and then you trying to play out your own half in golden point just get it just get it to fifth and kick it away and then just yeah. back your defence to do it like you can't afford to make those errors in that, in well, that time when that game went to Golden Point, I remember sitting there and thinking, okay, like, Golden Point's been around in the Super League for a while. Obviously, it's been in there for longer, but at least all of our squad have will have experienced Golden Point. They will have yeah. prepared for it. And, and so I was kind of hoping that we, we would sort of be ready for that. So I was really shocked that, that the fact that we did, like, make those sloppy mistakes in our own half like especially when you're receiving the ball first in golden point you just have to stick it with your jumper and try and make yardage and get as far away from the post as possible yeah it's, yeah it's crazy isn't it how that works mm. um one thing i noticed i don't know if you guys noticed this at home but defensively Tompkins would defend at full back whilst in the halves like as their numbers suggested they would in attack Tompkins was always first receiver like to me, that doesn't make sense. You expect someone like Williams to get the ball first because he can he can pass, he can kick, he can run, he can do it. He's, he's got everything. You've got Wellsby then the second, or that, even if Wellsby's and Tompkins are fullback and second receiver, but Tompkins was playing at first receiver for a lot of that, especially when we got into like the final twenty and we were trying to do something. He's not someone who's going to create tries. He's usually someone that finishes them off when he's got that little bit of space. Like we said, we don't know what Sean Wayne's plan was and. Honestly, not many people asked him in the presser after the game because he was visibly upset. But it would be nice to understand sort of where that decision came from. Um, but like you said, like I said already, Wellsby seemed to just get the, the, the stage seemed to get the better of him. Like there was uncharacteristic errors from him, but he's only 21 years old, so you're going to expect it. Moving on to a positive from this though, Samoa in a World Cup final. Like you couldn't ask for any more. Like unbelievable Samoa for me personally are always a second nation just because of the people that my family know and the relationships with top level like former Samoan internationals that have played at Halifax and family friends and stuff like that but for, for them to lose to Samoa for me was yeah England have lost but actually I've always had that soft spot for Samoa and the way Samoa are playing if they did if they if they had a, a decent hooker in this World Cup final, I'd be like, you know what, this is going to be a great thing. But I think the fact that their spine is a little bit disjointed is what's going to be the problem in the in the final. But what an absolute positive for them to get to this, this far in the tournament. Yeah, and they've like properly earned it, didn't they? They've had yeah. to beat Tonga in that like bruising game that went right down to the wire, and then again followed it up the next week with the hosts who seemingly are unstoppable that trash you in the first round. Again, that goes down to the wire. So. This is like a proper fairy tale World Cup for them. Yeah, and we're all Samoan, aren't we? Aren't we, Toby? Are you Samoan this week? Yeah, I'm definitely Samoan, and I think I'm also Penrith now as well because of that. Because there's so many Penrith players in this yeah. Samoa side. But yeah, it's it is fantastic, and I I, I think Samoa can pull it off. I think that you know, 
they've got they've got the cohesiveness that the Australians don't. And I mean, I listened to a couple of Australian league podcasts that I found recently. Um, James Graham's got a really good one as well. Um, but I'm not gonna I'm not, I won't shout him out because obviously you should always listen to him. Um, but yeah, it's um, it like that you know everyone sort of believes that Australia have just got a bit too much quality. But everyone's worried about Australia's cohesiveness, and I think, for me, it's actually quite a big game because Samoa winning this game for me is like is everything international rugby league needs to be able to go into next year with a proper fixture calendar with Australia wanting to play to prove they're the best in the world. Mm. Like all this needs to happen, and it's almost like I feel for me, I feel like there's more pressure on Samoa than I think they actually realise there is so I hope they can play without that pressure and they don't you know they don't see it as that pressure um, but yeah really exciting matchup isn't it seeing like you've got Jerome Luai versus Nathan Cleary and you've got you've got a, like a forward pack that's like got state of origin players on both sides it really is like, I think it, it is I think on paper probably the best two sides but uh, you know I said New Zealand were the best side at the start just because I thought they'd have more time together as a unit. Mm. But yeah, I think that now, I hope that Tim Laffey as well can just have a fantastic game against Australia. Like, I really am hopeful, like, because he has been, like, he is the best centre we've ever seen in Super League. Yeah. Like, which sounds ridiculous and sounds over the top. We didn't even realise it until he played in the World Cup. No, yeah, and that was the, that was the thing. You speak to someone like Tim Laffey with, with a potential... Um, move on the horizon into the NRL but speaking of Australia really quickly the, the last two they haven't, they haven't lost in their last five but the last five games they've played have been at this World Cup in the game since the 2017 World Cup they've only played four games not in a World Cup they've played two in 2018 two in 2019 and then none in 2020 none in 2021 so they've come into this for two years no world, no international fixtures but two of those four they lost they lost to New Zealand in Auckland, and they also lost to Tonga at Eden Park as well. Like, if Samoa beat them, that will be three losses in their last ten games. Uh, the best team in the world, it can't lose three in the in their in their last ten games. You look at New Zealand in Rugby Union; they went on like a thirty-eight game win streak. In Ireland, have hit thirty-seven. I think England hit thirty-five once, and. Like these at that time, these guys are the best international teams in the world. But they can't beat the other. If they can't beat the, if, if Australia can't beat Samoa this weekend, they're not gonna. Yes, Samoa would have won the World Cup, and they will be the best team in the world. But the Australians will not like that, and maybe that's the kick up. Like you said, the kick up the ass that they need to to really care. Speaking on Tim Laffey though, he said we didn't realise how good he was until the World Cup. The, he wasn't even selected originally like if that in, if those injuries don't happen in it's the massive what if questions but if those injuries don't happen in that opening game against England to Tyrone May and Patrick is it Patrick Tago that got injured as well if those injuries don't happen Ken Seo and Tim Laffey don't come into that squad and maybe they don't get the impact that Tim Laffey has he doesn't these lads necessarily don't like Tyrone May doesn't necessarily have a point to prove does he whereas Tim Laffey does It's an, an interesting um, thing, isn't it? A blessing in disguise. I think. Um, I think he like just in the in the England game, he was massive, wasn't he? Like he yeah. he was the difference. And like Callum Watkins is a player that's got that pedigree, got the experience. Like fair enough, he he sort of dropped off the last couple of years, but he's really built back that form. But Tim Laffey embarrassed him, didn't he? Like yeah, he, he completely made him look like an amateur. So. Yeah, it's, it's cool to see how um, his career will potentially be completely revitalised off the back of a tournament that he wasn't even originally invited to. Yeah, and, and I sat down and, well, I didn't sit down, I, I spoke to Tim Laffey after the game on um, Saturday, I think, well, yeah, on Saturday afternoon, and this is what he had to say. For you on a personal level, and not originally selected for the squad, in my opinion today, man of the match for the, for the Samoa's hide. Is the NRL back on your horizons? After oh, the look, oh, oh, you know, if, it does, you know, if there, there is any offers, you know, I'd love to take it because um, you know, that's where myself and my wife's um, families are. 
Um, but you know, I'll just um, you know, keep enjoying my, my rugby over here for the time being. Um, yeah. What are the plans for you this year with Salford? Where do you think you can go after getting to the World Cup final with Samoa? How are you going to take that into pre-season and this and the oh, Super League season next year? I, I just think you know I could um you know take what I've learned you know with the, the NRL boys here and the young boys and you know take it into our Salford team. You know um, we know we've got that attack you know in Salford and I think I could just add my experience um, you know to, to the team and you know and, and be a leader for, for for my team. And what was it like going up against Callum this afternoon? Obviously teammates. Yeah, look, um, he had me on my toes. I knew, he, you know, he's a class player, um, Cal. So I had to do my homework, you know, during the week, you know, on him, uh, not just myself, but my whole edge, you know, because we knew the threat he he posed and you know what he did to us in that first game. And he's, you know, what well, I think has been the best centre in the in the tournament. So um, yeah, I had to make sure I was out there for 80 minutes, you know, always just giving him pressure. So that was um, Tim Lafayette speaking of sort of how he got on during this tournament, sort of his views of what it means to him, what his future is going to look like, whether it's in the NRL, whether it's with Salford. Very interesting thoughts on what he thought about Callum Watkins. I don't think he was kind of bigging him up a little bit. He said he's been one of the best centres in the tournament. He obviously hasn't watched Stephen Crichton much, has he? <laughs> yeah, he's on teammate. <laughs> no, I think I think that's maybe just, you know, he's being polite to his teammate. He, did, he already embarrassed him out of the pitch. He didn't want to do it in the press afterwards <laughs> as well. No, that's very true. Um, Toby, I was going to move on to Australia and do New Zealand, but I'll, I'll jump into that. We'll, we'll jump into the NRL watch because there's some obviously there's some different NRL news and stuff to to, to bring up. Um, Tim Lafayette in the NRL. Any any teams that are sticking their heads out a little bit? Any teams with a little bit of money that could do with a a centre that is probably wanting one last goodbye to and finish his career over here or over in the NRL? Thirty-one years old now is Tim Lafayette. Yeah, look, it's very difficult, um, mainly because, you know, many teams have sort of already budgeted for the year as it stands. Has he gone? I'm back. Not there. You're back. You're here. You are here. I'm here. You're here. I'm yeah. here. Yeah. So it's, uh, no, it's a difficult one to tell, to be honest, because, uh, because a lot of teams are sort of already ready. Um, I'd have looked at sort of the bulldog shipping off Aaron Shook to uh, the Titans and said, oh, there's a space, there's a left centre space there. But I very much feel like that's being filled by Braden Burns. Mm. Um, I think that, yeah, left centre seems to be the one that a lot of people want to play. And right centre is where the is where there's a need for players. Um, we've seen that he fits really nicely into a Panthers back line. Um which I don't think the Panthers have necessarily got the money knocking about, but Isaac Targo could definitely come into second row as a powerful ball runner and see what lap I can offer at left centre if the Panthers just wanted to take the mick a little bit. Um, well, with Kick Line, with yeah, Kick Cow and Corristar heading out the door, they've probably got a little bit of money to spend, haven't they? Yeah, well, I think it depends how they've sort of re signed their contracts and stuff. Mm. It looks like Spencer Lemieux could be on, on the way as well. Um, so yeah, there's definitely there, there is some room for it, and I think that you know I think that it would be a definite sort of not improvement, but a, a, you know a definite signing of intent for this season, which I think they might be missing a little bit um, right now. The Panthers. I mean, I'm sure that you'd uh, love to take them at the Tigers as well. Yeah, there's um, booth, especially now we've got rid of Hastings. Like, right. what what an absolutely fantastic managerial decision that was to get rid of arguably one of our best players and one of our one of the fan favourites from last season. Well done. Yeah, so I and think we that's brought in a forward way. that's nearly thirty, just under the age of thirty, but that just wants to retire and get a big paycheck. Like, you don't. I know you said last year we got one of the worst forward packs in the NRL, but David Clemens not going to fix that problem. We tried that with James Palmo. He hasn't done it. He's gone back to the Cowboys. Like. It's not going to work. Like we needed players to fit. It. Like why did why the, the Knights wanted Brooks? The fans don't want Brooks. Why has Brooks not been the one that's gone out the door to save ourselves a million pound or a million dollars a year? Or well, probably not a million because Clemmer will be on a, a decent wedge. But you, you're giving you probably yourself another two between two and two hundred and four hundred k to to spend on someone else there, aren't you? If you get rid of Brooks and bring Clemmer in, well, the Knights wanted Brooks. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's a clear decision by Tim Sheens. Um, 
but he wants he wants books and do I as his or, or do a do a um, is it is it do a now? Um, yeah, with with as his half back combo. Interesting, I think for me, uh, outside of those two, there isn't really anyone who's got experience playing in the half. So if one of those goes down, you are looking at um, either Dane Laurie coming into the halves mm. or Api Corisau going into the halves. You know, it's funny because the sort of thing is that there's three big money halves and you can only afford to have two, but they don't play like three big money halves, do they? No. Not um, at all. I think that's definitely sort of a concern. Um, I think that forward pack wise, they have strengthened, you know, at the end of the day. They've brought in Clemo, they've brought in Coruscant, um, you know, they've got off Gary in there still, and I think that there is something to like. Um, about this Tigers team now, um, but I'm not sure. Can you, can yeah, I think it is, please. Can you just tell me what it is? What? Because at the minute I don't. Other than uh, oh wait, there isn't any. Other than Dane Laurie at fullback, and that's it really. I'm you've not, got a weird Papali in there as well. Yeah, Papali and Coruscant are, are coming into that team really do help. But I mean, it's... Will Smith then I guess he's done a little bit, but then again, he's just Will Smith probably going to half. To be fair. You probably find Will Smith a I don't know. I don't well, know. Will Smith's probably signed to the extended squad apparently. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't understand what really. I don't really get what what's going on. But yeah, um, it's all a bit confusing for the Tigers, I think. But I'll tell you what: if you were the Newcastle Knights, you're very happy with your signing there. Yeah, I'm hundred percent. Um, I, I just don't see it. I don't understand it. Can't get my head around it. Um, something else I can't get my head around. Um, and as our NRL, NRL expert. Is anyone going to want to sign James Bentley because Leeds want to get him out the door? <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think that the only logical place for him to go would be to South Sydney, um, yeah. as just to be able to play that one game a year against the Sydney Roosters, have it out with Victor Radley yeah. at the uh, whistle. They play each other like four times, so that'd be well. No, they'd all be they'd both be banned for part from all of them. Yeah, they? so it's just no, the first game of the season. Giving him his credit, Leeds fans rave about Bentley. Like in terms of the second half of that Leeds season, he calmed down a lot. Before me. the grand final, Bentley was a huge part in turning that team round. Yeah, he, Bentley had a fantastic down. second half of the season for Leeds. Um, Leeds really rates him, and I think that an NRL coach who is willing to let's be honest, he's he's going to be a cheap player to sign. An NRL, an NRL coach who backs themselves as being able to sort out somebody's discipline could actually come in and get quite a quite a steal, quite a squad player. Do you reckon he'd go to Even the Dolphins? Huh? Eh? Do you reckon he'd go to the Dolphins? It depends on Wayne Bennett's feelings on that kind of player. To be honest, um, you know, I could see him more going to be to be in a Melbourne Storm and sort of because you know. They like to sort of get a bit grubby around the wrestle, a bit of a Felice Cafusi replacement. Yeah, there's a lot of players to replace at some of these clubs where obviously the players are yeah. to this new team. So there's there's obviously another team full of 25 spots that you need to fill with top quality players. So you'll probably find a lot more Super League players will go over for more money, but not necessarily more game time. Um, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit, this Victor Radley versus James Bentley situation. Um, according to the BBC Sport, which is where I'm reading this now, Sydney Roosters Radley was involved in an altercation with the Leeds Rhinos James Bentley at a hotel in Manchester on Sunday. The England team was staying in the hotel following the, the defeat to Samoa on the Saturday. Um, Ra- Bentley is rumoured to be the instigator as he was seen abusing and um, basically trying to get a reaction out of Sean Wayne. Um and so Radley stepped in to protect his coach and supposedly headbutted Bentley, who needed stitches. Um, that's as far as I've read. It's obviously being investigated, but I'm so happy someone's finally told Bentley what to do with himself and stepped up and stood up to him because all year we've talked about how much of a grub he's been and everything else. Just, I don't know. Yeah, it's just mental, isn't it? It is a bit of an odd situation. So this happened after the Samoa game. This happened on the Sunday. Um, 
Yeah, on a Sunday. I get and yeah. I guess they were all out having a meal or something, and apparently Bentley was invited back to the England hotel by an England by a teammate. So I'm guessing a Leeds player. Is there any other maybe a Ledsky oh, invited okay. him back? Like who else would it have been that would? Who else is in the England squad that's a Leeds player that would have invited him back? Just it was a Saints player he knew him from that time. Yeah, maybe it could have been. Yeah, it could have been. But it, either a Ledsky or a Bachelor, no, no, probably Knowles, right? Knowles probably wanted him to come and have a party. Um, it wouldn't have been. I don't think it would have been Welsby or Mason soon after some. I don't know. I don't. I just have a feeling that the Saints lads didn't particularly like him, and I don't know. I'm just glad that Victor Radley's gone and done something about it because, yeah, just absolutely ridiculous. Um. Should we should we touch on Australia and New Zealand semi final? Should we talk about how good the game was in terms of its technical value and how much better it was technically than the England game? It was another level, wasn't it? I yeah. was um, I was lucky enough to be there. And it was just I was unlucky uh, enough not to be there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I want to I want to talk about how amazing it was, but I don't want to <laughs> rub it in too badly. Yeah, that's fine. I got to the England game for free and I got free food, so I was pretty happy. That's true. Yeah, yeah. That was that. And what an event as well, having that at the Emirates. But, yeah, yeah this, this game at, at Ellen Road, um, it was packed and it was just amazing. I was sat in a corner and I, I was in one of those seats where everything's right in front of you, so I didn't have yeah. to turn my head. And I was just literally sat there like, gone, like, my jaw, I'm drooling. I'm just <laughs> taking it all in. I didn't say a word for 80 minutes. I was just mesmerised. It was it was cool. fantastic. And um, I, I think we, was, we were saying earlier about, like, do the kangaroos um, need a kick up the backside? Like you know, they've not been the completely dominant side that um, makes them apparently the best team in the world. But I think this, I think this could have been it. Like they were, they were pushed and they could have easily lost this game. That to come back from behind and they took advantage of um, just probably the only lapse in concentration of the whole game when um, when they got the uh, the penalty just in front yeah. of the line. And um, when Brandon an absolutely knackered Brandon Smith, who just made four tackles on the bounce, he yeah. stood behind, and the referee, like fair enough, he doesn't need to let him get ready, but he blows the whistle. Klein doesn't. That's what I mean. Australian referee in an Australian game, you know. I thought, yeah, was very, I didn't think the referee was particularly fair. Um, but yeah, the only I think it was. A, I think it was okay. I think it was like a high intensity game and. I think he like allowed it to be played like that, and there was there was a few sort of like pushes and shoves that he just sort of let it go by, and, and I I was grateful for that because I think that it, it 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 the aggression levels were high, but because of the high skill level at the same time, it was all put into the right the right places rather than having like a James Bentley style like lashing out. It was yeah. like the 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 hits just got harder. They didn't get higher or late or anything like that they just they were, it was just powerful and physical for the whole game so I, I quite enjoyed it from that point of view um yeah it, it was just it was just amazing and I, I there was I noticed just from just from my experience there was loads of people there that didn't hadn't seen the game before every well, every good. time there was um the set restart and you hear the hooter I every single time I heard multiple conversations of people like oh so what does that mean and it just indicates that there was a lot of neutrals there, and I mean, how lucky if you're a neutral if this is your first introduction to rugby league. Yeah. Um, like that try that that Josh had a car scored from the um, unreal Ben Hunt's kick forty meters out. Like it's not even a place that you think about an attacking kick, but that was just probably one of the highlights of my whole rugby league <laughs> viewing ex- lifetime. It was amazing, and That's yeah. Awesome. I, I think in a way that that match deserved to be the grand final, but yeah. it kind of it just the fact that it happened is is it enough to make yeah. this whole tournament worth it. Yeah, um, I just want to point out that Josh Adokar has scored twelve tries in this tournament, which equals Valentine's home record from five years ago for tries in a tournament. He's got one more game to go. Um, if that, if Josh Adokar scores uh, a hat, uh, scores four tries. He will have scored sixteen, which is the same amount of tries that Billy Slater scored in, like, three tournaments, <laughs> which is absolutely ridiculous. Same as Jared Haynes scored fourteen over three tournaments, and 
but as Ryan Hall has scored 14 over three tournaments. Adokar has come in and he's really cha- he's really just added something to this Australia team that it like the New South Wales Origin team didn't have. And I mean, Toby, you would have seen that more because obviously having watched the, having realised that decision. How how gutted would you be if you're a New South Wales Australia fan going, oh yeah, I'm really happy we're winning the we're going to potentially win the World Cup and we're in a World Cup final, but why the hell wasn't this bloke picked for our Origin side this year? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that, you know, at that point in time that Adokar probably makes a difference to, to how that team, you know, to how the Origin squad plays necessarily. But that said, I mean, I think that I, I genuinely believe that the try we saw him score is once in a lifetime. No one will ever see a bomb go for 30, 40 metres and it just accidentally end up in the hands of an on-rushing winger ever again. Like, that was simply incredible um i think that he's been let down a little bit by the bulldogs this year um they haven't used him properly they haven't unleashed in the way that you know he can be unleashed and i think that this is really i think that the conversations coming out of australia now is actually you know we slept on this guy after he left storm um we expect you know but seeing him now like he is the best winger he is the best if not one of the best He's the, he is the best winger at the moment, if not one of the best wingers of all time with what he's able to do. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's something which we'll only be able to truly say once his career's over. But he really is, like, in a class of his own. Yeah, someone else, uh, we're talking of class of their own, the Golden Boot announcements were, were made the other night. Joey Manu uh, won the men's Golden Boot, um, Ray McGregor won the women's Golden Boot, and Seb Bashara won the wheelchair Golden Boot. Um, three fantastic players, th- players we've mentioned all tournament for every single team they've played for. For me, to meet the Golden Boot winner in York on a rainy Sunday morning or <laughs> Saturday morning, whatever it was, that's I've completed life. Like if you're pick, if I'm picking a rugby league team of rugby league players I've met and had a photo with, he's the only one that he's the first name on that team sheet every week. No matter how, like, you just have to, and to think, and to think of the fact that he is. He's just so good, and he doesn't play. Doesn't play fullback for his club. That's ridiculous. And do you know it? what though? Like, I I'm not a massive fan. I'm, well, he's very good. He's defensively very good, and he's very good with the ball in hand. But he is. He's a selfish fullback in many respects, and I I think that he does like. I do think there is many times where you know, you want him to just take less carries, not touch the ball as much, and I I don't think that. He, you know, he has been the best player at the World Cup, and I was surprised that he was given the Golden Boot, um, because I think that, you know, a player who, I think that players who have probably, um, had their hand in more tries, would would have got that award. But by the same token, you know, I think that everyone admits that Joey Manu has a skill set that is specific to him, and that makes him a fantastic player. Yeah, I mean, he's had three tries, five try assists, 57 tackle breaks, two line breaks, 79% tackle efficiency. In terms in terms of his running metres, he's had a total of 1,301 running metres, an average of 260 um, in this World Cup per game. That's ridiculous. Like in terms It is, but I think <laughs> that's it's mental. hindered New Zealand. It hindered New, Z- New Zealand more than the stats suggest, I think. Yeah. In terms of, yeah, so I think that, and I think, you know, after their performance against Fiji, I thought that I, I would have understood if you ha- if you put Nickel Klockstad at fullback for his defending and had Manu uh, directly up against Mitchell. But not that that made a difference to the end result of this game. Like, absolutely it didn't. At the end of the day, Australia scored from that mm. that penalty. Brandon Smith had was forced to play way too many minutes when Jeremy Marshall King is in the squad and could have relieved him of some of that time. Yeah. And and in the last fifteen twenty minutes, Australia was a team of a, a you know one to seventeen, s three in the world in their position in each play, you know in each position if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Like they knew how not to make a mistake they didn't give the ball away they didn't give New Zealand a chance to to gain field position from a stupid penalty or from a six again mm. they really did like and if they did it was once like 
but it, yeah, they really just knew how to close out a game, and New Zealand just started to the panic, started to make mistakes, started to get tired, and Australia were ready to go for another ten minutes at the end of that game. Yeah, and that, that was something that when we speak about the women's game, it's going to be very different. In the NRLW, they only play 35 minutes a half. They play 40 over here in Super League. And I thought, oh, maybe that's going to make a difference. Maybe our players are going to be that little bit fitter. But the, the Kiwis just absolutely came out and absolutely ruined the the, um, the Lionesses. But I think we do need a new nickname for them because every single female women's team in this country seems to be called the Lionesses and like top-level sport, which is something that needs to change. But uh, Ray Sheen McGregor, the, the New Zealand halfback, also a Sydney rooster, um, is the female golden boot winner. How good was she on Monday night? Um, I mean, Robin, you watched this live. You were there, weren't you, I believe? I was there, yeah. Um, that was York. Cool. You've never seen York that busy, have you? No, I... <laughs> yeah, from personal experience, it was the busiest I've ever seen it, and, and that was really impressive. And again, lots of neutrals, probably more neutrals than, than regular, that I think, actually, if there's any criticism I've got for York, they've put on a great tournament, and I think they've really managed to, like, drill up some interest but where where are my fellow knights like where are these fans that come and watch the york knights men's team because i didn't see many of them turn up for the women's group stages or the semi-final which i think is a real shame and i think actually that they've missed out on some quality matches and they've li- literally seen the best in the world like like um Rasheen. so on on the england game um like england got off to the perfect start the first mm. 10 minutes was literally faultless. Every single carry, every single decision, the passes were crisp, they were tackling strong, they were just doing everything right, and those those kicks um, from Roche were absolutely spot on, they, on the money, and they totally deserved the first try, and um, Tara Stanley nailed the kick from out wide, and we're 6 nil up, and I'm starting to think, like, hang on, like, they, they mean business here, but Slowly and surely, um, New Zealand find their way back into the game, and they just ground England down. And it was um, really impressive to see, actually, just just how controlled they were, how methodical. Um, they just they, they just played completely to their strengths. I mean, um, New Zealand all tournament, their, their defence has been really their strong point, and I think that that managed to just choke England. And um, they didn't need to do much in attack; they just needed to. Um, keep rolling over and, and, and keeping the metres coming and they managed to um, keep the play of the balls quick which meant there was quite a lot of set restarts and that gave them field position um, and off the back of that their two um, cannonball centres were just like causing ha- complete havoc and, Yeah, how good is um, is it Hafwanga? Or how, I don't know how you say the name but she was unbelievable the, on the right edge for New Zealand Yeah, he, she's it was, it was such an interesting play because like the, the size difference is, is crazy, and um, but she has quite a slow acceleration. But once she gets up to speed, she's mm-hmm. unstoppable. So it was kind of like you could see the English players as soon as she got the ball were like dashing to get to her and just cling on and slow her down before she could get up to speed. Because when she did, she was just busting tackles left, right, and center. Yeah, defensively um, as well. Was it, is it Amber Hall, the second rower? Like she was. She was yeah, just, like every like people were just Holland Clark, like, yeah, Amber Paris Ball, Clark, Crystal Lothar, like just just unbelievable. Like, yeah, we just couldn't we couldn't deal with them physically. They were just too strong and, and too powerful. Where who wins this World Cup final? Because the, from what I've seen of Australia, yes, they are unbelievable, and they did beat New Zealand. But New Zealand gave them a real good fright last week mm. in in the quarter in that semi final. Uh, no, sorry, in the in the last game of the group stage and. But we know Australia had rested a few. New Zealand have sort of played the same team throughout. They've played a lot more rugby together. They they had a much more difficult semi final to come through. New, Australia kind of breezed through that semi final against PNG. Yeah, like, absolutely. This one, this is the probably the toughest one. I know that the wheelchair one we'll get onto in a second, but this is probably the toughest of the three finals to really call. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually like. Don't get me wrong. The the men's final is going to be awesome, but I'm really excited for this one. This is the one that's actually getting me, um, the most excited because we've got a rematch of that game that was really close, and and I think that um, like New Zealand. I think that they've improved since that game with Australia. I think that they were much better against England. Yeah. Um, Australia, are a team that are very quick and light. Um, and agile, and they just—they seem to be able to score from anywhere because they're just so athletic. 
um, whereas New Zealand are a, a much bigger side um, that tend to kind of like like to sort of grind down the opposition. So it just it just depends whether Australia can kind of um, keep the ball flowing and, and run the forwards around, or whether New Zealand can start to gain some field position and like enter the arm wrestle. Because if they can, if they can keep it as that kind of a game, then I, I think that they can get the result. Yeah, Toby, do you think it's as close to call as I think it is, or do you think that maybe one team has definitely got the edge over the other? Oh, I think that's quite a difficult question to answer. I think that there is a team who will be favourites with, you know, with the bookies. Um, I, you know, I think that's obvious that that's Australia. But yeah, I think that both teams are capable now. You know, you look at you look at Samoa England, like the group stage, and now is very different times of a tournament. Um, and I hope that this is actually a fantastic game, and I think that women's game really has come out of come out of this as a lot bigger than it was before the start of this World Cup and that's really great to see yeah 100% one thing that is a bit disappointing to see from an England point of view is uh, Craig Richards left his role as women's head coach following the defeat um, his statement from on Monday says I've spent five years trying to close the gap it is not good enough um, it will be someone else who takes the team forward that decision was made a while ago it won't be me so I'll support from afar uh, Craig, and he took over following the 2017 World Cup and he led England to 9 wins across his 11 test matches in charge which is it's 11, he's been there 5 years they've only played 11 test matches it's not enough is it but he was appointed straight away um, it was extended by 12 months he went on tour to Papua New Guinea which I believe they lost one of those games in Papua New Guinea they did do the World Nines over there as well. But the way you look at the way Australia demolished that PNG side in their semi-final, England lost that PNG side three years ago. Leeds have only just started paying their players. This is this is this is a tough one because I don't know I don't really know what happened. We, we spoke about what happens next for the England men's team. Where do they go? How do the England women's team go forward from here? Do they do they need to, well? We know they need to be paid, but how how do you know what I mean? Like how do we? How do we provide them that without killing the game in terms financially? Because we know that the rugby league isn't the most financially profitable sport in terms of people that, like, in terms of the money that it brings in. So the more players we play, the less money the sport makes. If that does that, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think the solution for me, um, and I think I'd like to hear Robin's sort of opinions on this, especially. But I think the solution for me would be one is to schedule more women's internationals sort of even if it is like every you know one every two months or two every two months you know really like the, the women's super league season is quite a small season compared to the men's and i think like have that chance to just schedule these internationals because we know that these internationals can go on bbc and be watched on tv yeah. and yeah. sort of work from there get people watching it there re find realizing the standard enjoying the game and then go from there say like look if you want to watch this here's a unique time slot that's not going to clash with your football or your men's rugby league where you can watch the women's rugby league at the local grounds near you um hopefully get a revenue in get a loyal fan base um in and then yeah and also i think kind of be serious about what a super league team is yeah. in the women's yeah. competition and if that means that there's only six teams who are professional but there's six teams who get people in you know who are who are able to pay the women professionally and are able to, mm. you know, build maybe even build an academy side and work like that. You know, look at the NRLW. It's very much like we've got six teams. We'll expand when we're ready. Um, you know, whereas you look at women's Super League and Super League South, it's just like let's add team after team after team yeah. after team, and it's very like it needs to start as a small product and the professional player base needs to grow and grow and grow. Whereas right now, Women's Rugby League in England is looking to have a wide pay player base and cherry pick the best of lot this wide player base for the national team. But I think in terms of being able to let these women go professional and reach the standard of Australia and New Zealand, uh, that is what's going to what's going to need to happen is that the game be is to have a smaller professional league here that eventually grows over the next 10, 15 years into a twelve team. 
40 team league. Yeah, it's kind of taken a step backwards to take a step forward. Uh, Robin, what are your thoughts on what Toby just said? Yeah, I, I think I kind of agree. Like, I think at the top level, it needs to be a little bit smaller um, so that we can sort of invest more into the players that we've got. I think in the, in the short term, uh, a quick fix will be to try and, you know, help some of these um, players get over in the NRLW because we've not had many do that. And that would sort of instantly give them some, you know, tougher opposition. And I think that that, that would help them hone their skills a little bit. Um, but I would I would also be wary of, you know, shipping off all our talent and, and devaluing the product here. Um, I think another step that needs to be taken is, um, we, obviously, this um, fixture's just been announced in um, uh, is it in April. Uh, the, yeah, so that the England, England versus France and the men's and the women's. And I, and I get that you want people to see the women's game, and so it makes sense to do it as a double header. But I think we kind of need to treat it as its own product because, from from my experience of these World Cup games, it's a totally different audience that's going to the men's games mm. than what's going to the to the women's games. And so I think that, like, give it the respect that it deserves, and and, and make it its own event, and and you know go to these places that have got involved in the World Cup and. Um, just sell it like that. Like I think it's a it's a great opportunity to enter a new market, and pe- you know what I mean. Like, yeah, you, a lot of people are put off by big sports events where, where England are playing because they they assume that it's going to be a little bit like the football and it's going to be a bit rowdy and stuff. And, and I know that we're not like that in rugby, league, but to a neutral, they don't know that, and so I, I fear that that would put put people off. Whereas if you say this is a, a women's rugby league game. Like, look what we've we've done, and, yeah. and we kind of build that, and we create these events. Then I think that that's a, a much better way to go in the long run to help the women's game become its standalone uh, professional competition. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they do it in the football, don't they? The men and women don't play at Wembley at the same time. They play at different times, and they play all over. The women used to play all over. The, a lot of their games are now at Wembley because uh, it's their national stadium. But I feel like. With England rugby league not having a national stadium, you could do tours all over the country. Like you could have England women play in Wales somewhere. You could have England women play in Ireland somewhere closer to Ireland, like just close over to Ireland. It'd be like somewhere easily accessible from Ireland, so near a port or something like that. Like they could like even Liverpool probably a good one, so they could get it to there. And like there's so many different areas. One thing that I found really interesting this week when I was looking at towards the 2025 World Cup was that every single women's team in this tournament are, have already qualified for the 2025 World Cup because it will be expanded to 16 teams. So we will see Australia, Brazil, Canada, Cook Islands, England, France, New Zealand and PNG all in 2025, which I think is amazing because France know that they're going to be there, Brazil know they're going to be, Canada know they're going to be there, which means they've got three years to really develop their teams. But these guys know that these, these teams that didn't win this time round and that Brazil-Canada game was unbelievable in that group. Like these guys, these these teams have got three years to develop, but we're going to see one of Chile, Jamaica, and USA. We're going to see two of Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga. We're going to see four of Greece, Ireland, Italy, Malta, Serbia, Te- Turkey, and Wales. And then we're going to see one of Cameroon, Ghana, Lebanon, Morocco, Nigeria, and South Africa. I mean, some of those teams haven't played an international fixture before, but their tournaments lined up with those teams in place to qualify in 2025. The like you said, the expansion of the World Cup is going to be really good because. There'll be players that will play for more than one nation, same as in the um, men's game. If you're of Samoan and Tongan descent and you're not getting into the Australia and New Zealand side, you, you might see these guys go and play for their other nations. Like you've seen it this year with um, players playing, like ex Kiwis playing for the Cook Islands and Canada. They'll, they'll go and play for Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, like USA, it, European nations. And I really can't wait to see how that develops. From the teams that are not qualified which teams would you like to see play in that world i'll tell you what i'd, I'd look for me personally um i'd, I'd love to see like a jamaican women's team a, a fijian women's team ireland and wales look the strongest of some of those european teams to play because the way they, they play they played a lot of rugby recently but ireland italy and wales have got a european competition in themselves so i think there's going to be some cracking teams in that world cup but there's going to be more one-sided defeats as well at the same time yeah, and I think that that's um, this is where they need to be careful because um, we've seen a lot of blowout scores in the women's game, and and the sort of 
the semi-finals have proven that really we've only got three um, teams in that top bracket. Yeah. And between the rest of them, there are some tight matches and really entertaining games like like Brazil Canada. Um, so so I think that I think that um, Toby's idea the other week of, of like um, a group with the top four nations that's then seeded for the for the following rounds is the way to go when you're introducing so many different nations that like like you said some of them have never even played before so they they they're obviously going to be um, a, below the standard that's going to make it an entertaining watch. I mean the the eight nations that have qualified now. That have automatically qualified would will be um, should then be put into tiers. So the four that won their group should be number one. Like so, the teams that finish top of their group will be one. The teams that finish second in their group would also be one. So they'd be pool one. The teams that finish um, third and fourth would be pool two, and then the qualifiers would be drawn in three and four, sort of thing. So you'd have yeah. Australia, England, New Zealand. And PNG would not face each other in the group stage necessarily, which would then make your your quarterfinal. So then you are getting obviously your best teams at the end of the tournament. So, but like you, but then that also means you avoid the likes of Australia versus England or Australia versus New Zealand in the group stage, which some people would love to see. But the way the World Cup works, you want your best teams to play each other at the end of the tournament. So it's it's very much hit and miss, isn't it, on what you need to do? But I agree that in another sense, and we've mentioned this multiple times in this World Cup. Teams that finish third should go into a plate. Teams that finish fourth potentially in a bowl. That would be just to give them more fixtures. It doesn't necessarily have to be for anything, but it could just be, oh, this is the seventh, eighth playoff or whatever that is. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It would really work. Um, I don't really know where to move on to now. There's still so much sort of to to bring up. Wheelchair tournament. That was the one. Um, Toby, what went wrong, man? What went wrong? I thought Wales were going to be up there. I thought they were going to give us a fight in that semi-final on Sunday? I mean, you have to consider that in the grand scheme of things, we are up there. But yeah, there is there is a clear gap between Australia, France... Well, France, England, Australia, in that order. Then there's like... You know, if it was like a league, there'd be like a good three or four leagues with just nobody in them yeah. before you got down to Wales' level. And I think, I think that's all you can expect, really. You know, considering that a lot of the people who are going to get involved in wheelchair rugby league in England are going to, be, you know, are still going to be massive rugby league fans who want to play but just can't. Whereas in Wales, you play wheelchair rugby league because it's a sport you've kind of like, yeah, you, you've gravitated towards for for some reason. Um, you know, it's not like you've actively gone out there searching to play rugby league necessarily. Um, so yeah, I think that it's actually it's quite a proud moment, but it's also I find it incredible that on such a small pitch and. With you know, with these big wheelchairs, like five big wheelchairs on such a small pitch, to be able to score a hundred odd points, like that takes some serious practice yeah, and skill and talent. And I think that's like the main thing to come out of this is like the wheelchair game has just been so fantastic for me. Mm. Um, I think that it, you know, it's the one which I think I can I could get people who aren't interested in watching rugby to watch with me. Um, and I think that really is a credit, and I don't think that the score lines matter as much as I said in a previous no. podcast. Um, well, so yeah, in it's the wheelchair not... game because we know how one sided some games can be, and yeah, and the I think England that versus Wales right. game from was it last summer when they when we when we first saw it on the BBC, it wasn't as it wasn't as distant as one hundred and twenty five twenty two, but we also know that the England side wasn't as maybe as packed out as what it was, and the Wales side probably was missing a few, but. The, the way these scores have jumped to and from being really close or really far apart all the time is phenomenal. I mean, the USA had never played a game before and they went and beat Scotland in the first game of the World Cup and the, they ran Wales close before being annihilated by France. So you look at it and go, actually, this is quite entertaining how this works. Yeah. yeah. This was my first experience watching it. I, I was at this one in Sheffield um, and it, I, I'm a bit conflicted. I'm not going to lie. Don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed it. And the skill levels of these athletes is unbelievable. And, and when you think of how difficult it must be to use your arms to move around and do all these, these gross movements would, t- would completely shatter your arms. You would be, they would be under so much fatigue. To then also be able to catch and pass the ball with such fine skill 
when your arms must be absolutely burning is really incredible. But I do think that it would be useful to, to look at changing the rules ever so slightly because I think that um, the length of the game is just a little bit too long. I think that it would be nice if it was maybe 30-minute halves because yeah. it would it, it gets to a point where the result the game's dead and buried. And yeah, don't get me wrong, it's so addictive watching how they break down a defence and see, seeing like the kind of um, moves that they put on and stuff. But I just think it would help keep it a bit more intense, a little bit closer, um, and, and sort of like limit the the length of the blowouts. Like I think the the, the first game that was on um, Australia versus France, yeah. there was like periods where Australia sort of found their way back into the game a little bit, yeah. and then all of a sudden France had scored three, and it and it was back over again. And I think if it was sixty minutes, I could imagine a team that's um, you know on on the back foot putting in a solid half. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, 100%. It, it, the way that the game sort of flowed, it would be close for a bit and then all of a sudden, like England would score four tries. Mm. And so it, I feel like it would, it would stop that. So I, I think I, I think I would like to see that change. And I'm being super critical purely because I really enjoy it and I, and I want to see it take off and I, I want to see it continue. And I think loads of people have really enjoyed it. And it's still it's still very much in its infancy, so I think that we can get away with making changes now before it's really established. But I do think it would help to 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 bring the length of the games down, con- considering you know the pitch is so much smaller. So basically, every single break is a try anyway. You're yeah, not exactly, going to miss yeah. out on tries. You're not missing out a lot, are you? Mm. So no, I totally agree. Some of the score lines, like you said, even for a semi-final of like. The France Australia game was our, was the better game, but there was never any doubt of who was going to win the England Wales game. And I mean, yes, Wales had their moments, like, but their try, especially like in that start, start of that second half, the first twenty five minutes of that second half, Wales seemed to like be level with England, like fighting back, getting tries. But at the same time, England had stretched their lead. In, in the same time, it, Wales scored three tries. England had scored two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, six. It was six tries for three, even in that twenty-five minute period. Like that's a lot of tries. Like we, we yeah. people don't seem to understand. England scored t- twenty-two tries in that game against Wales. That's crazy. In the opening game of the tournament, again against Wales. Sorry, Toby. Um, France scored nearly thirty tries in that first game. Like that's too many. That's there's a lot of points in in games that don't necessarily that need to be that long. Uh, one positive though, Halifax Panthers have a golden boot winner. Seb Bashara, what a man. Um, how good have him and Jack Brown been in that England side? Oh my God, they are ridiculous, aren't they? Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Shea Bashara's sort of got a little bit more of that strength and so um, his his style's like a little bit more, um, he, he plays off the back of contact and sort of like looks to draw people in smash his way through the line and then find a pass or you know just just get away with his strength whereas Jack Brown's kind of relies on literally going through untouched he's so he's so agile and nimble like it's it was amazing actually watching him warm up and like the kind of the way that they just use only half of their body to come and and sort of like contort in these shapes and swing their arms around and stuff and and, um, rock their Sort of like upper torso yeah. to just control the chair. Then they're, they're not even um, sort of steering at all with the hands. It's just sort of like a bit, a bit like ice game where where you sort of like shift your balance to move forwards and stuff like that. And and he's the the control he's got is amazing. He was doing these like start, stop, turn around, go backwards, stop, turn around, go forwards yeah. thing in the blink of an eye. Like it's really incredible to see. And like I I think he's. Um, He's almost too good. He's almost like a level above everyone around him, and maybe the game needs to catch up. And like, who knows? In five years' time, we'll have teams that are just full of Jack Browns, and then it'll be like an amazing spectacle. Yeah, hundred percent. And just a quick shout out: Bedford Tigers, my team, great team. Um, two Scotland internationals are joining the Bedford Tigers um, wheelchair team, which kicks off this year. Paul uh, Lauder and Mitch Hartley will boost the start of that and also joining the team is disability darts world champion snowy dyson so there's some there's some celebrities joining the bedford tigers this year so that'll be really really interesting um they're cool. actually meeting they actually met tonight so i need to um 
figure out what is what was going on. Uh, it says Wednesday the fifteenth of November, but it's Wednesday the sixteenth. Um, so yeah, that was not the right date on the post, but never mind. I'm sure people still turned up. Um, speaking of the Woodshed tournament, it's it's set at six time, and it's the first game we're going to mention. Before we went live, I or oh, before we started recording, I said to the probably didn't say that it was going to be nine points available, and we were going to do team that wins, margin, correct score. Robin said, oh, why don't we do player of the match instead of correct score? I'm going to do both. So there's actually 12 points up for grabs. I'm not happy with it. (laughs) There is 12. And the only reason there's 12 points up for grabs is because I still want Toby to try and win. Right? Because it's close. Imagine it it will be finished within like a point. That would be really good, wouldn't it? After the whole season. We don't want to see blowout scores, Robin, do we? We're not a fan of blowout scores. So... But the fact we're all within nine of each, well, the nine points between you two, and I'm sat three points behind you, Owen. I'm I'm quite happy with the way this season's gone. Um, wheelchair final, England versus France. Score, well, margin first, score, and then your player of the match. Um, I'll go first. France are going to win. They're going to win by twenty-four. It's going to be. 60 points to 84 and Borsan's going to be the player of the match. Is that number four, Jeremy Borsan? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've almost got the same prediction, so I'm going to have to change it up slightly. <laughs> like, I, that was... So my, so, my player of the match, I reckon, as well, Jeremy Borsan. From what I saw, he was really awesome and... Um, he, he seems to play. He, he seems to get a lot of game time, mm. so I, I reckon that he's going to be an influential player. Um, I think it's going to be a bit closer, though. I think that um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it's a bit closer. I think that it's going to be um, 72, 66 to Oof. France. Jeez, only a margin of six points. Okay, uh, yeah, to France, uh, Toby. Yeah, I'm going to say it's going to be 56 to 46 to England with Jack Brown as the player of the match, and that's just to try and get the points. <laughs> I think it's still a good shout. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is like I mean, we said, I said earlier on the women's, the women's final is probably the toughest to choose, but these are the two best teams in the world. Um, you've got the Australia versus New Zealand women's game, two best teams in the world. England versus France in the wheelchair, two best teams in the world. And the way it looks at the minute, Australia versus Samoa, the two best teams in the world. Like Samoa are better than the New Zealand side that Australia beat in the semi-final, in my opinion, just in the way they play as a team. Uh, women's final time, Australia versus New Zealand. I think, I think for me it's Australia, but I'm still debating on the score and everything else. But I think Australia will win this one. I don't know if either of you have a set plan for this. So difficult, isn't it? <laughs> it's not easy at all. I've got to go against the grain again. So I'm going New Zealand by four. I think it'll be 20 to 16 to New Zealand. And I'm going for the only New Zealand player that I've really taken note of because she is an absolute monster of a prop forward. Reminds me of a man with the same surname, Frank of how good yeah. he was. And yeah, the net new Asala. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I fair yeah, crazy forward. Um, like everything about this New Zealand team is really really good. Um, I'm gonna go Australia to win. But the player of the match is not gonna be an Australian player. It's gonna, it's gonna be McGregor, because the way she has played in the whole tournament is unbelievable. Australia are gonna win by eight. And it's going to be 18-10. Because New Zealand can't kick goals, but McGregor's going to score quite a few of them points. So he's going to score both them tries. Interesting. Robin, go on, wrap it up. I'm going to say Australia 36. No, no, no. No, that's too high. 36? It's a World Cup final, man. Australia 18. Mm. New Zealand twelve. New Zealand and can't kick goals, man. Is this gonna be? Is this gonna be four yeah, tries, no conversion? Three tries, no conversion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, 
Ali Briggenshaw as the player of the match. The Australian half. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, seeing as Toby went first on the women's, I went first on the wheelchair, Robin. Wrap up the men. Start the men's final prediction for us. The final prediction of the year. So, I'll be honest. I... I see. I want to say that Australia are going to be comfortable winners, but I think that the Samoa team, there's a lot of players in the Samoa team that are just used to playing these Aussies every week, and so it's not as big an occasion for them. It's just like a regular season match. I know that there's more on the line, but mm. the, the terms of like the, the people they're coming up against, there's no shock there. They, they will have already had experience playing against them, playing with them, etc. So, um, I think Australia are going to win. I think they're going to win 24-20. And I think that they like to... I feel like from what I've seen when they've picked the, the um, Player of the Match awards in this World Cup is they kind of like to come up with a narrative before the game mm. and then just make it work. Yeah, I agree. And go, oh yeah, they were always going to be man of the match. They are the man of the match. And I think that, that they'll write the narrative this week about James Tedesco. Ooh. Ooh. That's not the name I was expecting to come out of your mouth just then. I was halfway through writing Cleary down before you said it. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Um, Toby, you've got the final... No, yeah, before I do the, the last one, you, you've got yours. I was about to say, I've written my prediction down and I forgot I haven't said it out loud yet. Um do you want to go first or shall I? Or... Yeah, well, I'll go first. No, I like, I'm in two minds about this. Like, we haven't seen many low scoring games, but I think the Australian finals and stuff, like the really tense ones, they tend to not often get into double figures. I don't know if that's a smart play or not, um, but I'm going to go for eight points to six. Ooh. To Samoa. To Samoa? Oh, man. My. It... Oh, my. Jeez, who's better than Max? Umoa. And because of that fact that eight point factor, I think there's gonna have to be a penalty in there. There's gonna have to be uh, and because of that I think I'm gonna go with Stephen Crichton. Oh, we're so in tune, yeah. you and me. We are so in tune. I've gone Samoa, sixteen points to twenty two. Uh Stephen Crichton, man of the match. Yeah. I, I mean, think I genuinely think this Samoa team can win this World Cup. Like I, th I haven't wanted to say it all episode in case one of you got into it, but I don't mind saying it. Samoa to win the World Cup is a dream. And I just think as a squad, as a collective, the battles they've been through in the last five years, p trying to like pick their squad, the way they've come together and embraced their culture, like the amount of players that play for the same team, all NR well, all but one or two NRL-based players in the, in the 17. Yes, they don't have a hooker, that didn't seem to affect them at all at the weekend. Yeah, I just know how his producer is like, this is his game. He can afford to break every bone in his body because he's not playing next year. Leave <laughs> <laughs> it so all bad. out there. Yeah, like, I think the thing is that they will, won't they? Like, these, these, these Australians, they don't have it, like you said at the start. You said you, you summed it up perfectly. They, the Australians don't care about the, the game at all, do they? They don't care about the international game. The players might, but the, the actual top dogs and the CEOs and the chairmans and the club owners and the, the, even the Australian Rugby League Commission, they don't care about the international game. These Samoans are playing not just for themselves and their country, but they're playing for their family, they're playing for their friends, they're playing for everyone else who isn't Australian on the planet this weekend. And <laughs> I know there's probably not going to be 70,000 people there like we, they would have had if England had made both finals, but anyone who isn't Australian in that stadium is going to be screaming for Samoa to win that game. Mm. I want a Samoa flag. I want a New Zealand flag. I want stuff. I want to be waving stuff about. I want to be Samoan. I'm Samoan all week. I was Samoan as soon as that final whistle... Well, maybe not as soon as the final whistle went, because I was pretty heartbroken, but by the time I'd got on the, the train, I was like, you know what? I'm Samoan for a week, well, 10 days, or however long it's going to be. I am Samoan. Yeah, yeah no... <laughs> Of all the predictions that we've made tonight, I, Toby's 8-6 Steve Crichton man of the match in a Samoa victory is the one that I want to happen the most. <laughs> oh, is that because if I get mine right, I'm probably going to overtake you? No, that's just because <laughs> it would be just like 
one of the greatest World Cup finals ever, wouldn't it? And it, it would just I, I imagine how tense it would be at Old Trafford and the satisfaction of seeing the Aussies get mm. beat. Imagine and, they all finished on the same amount of points. That'd be mental. We have to yeah. do a tie break. So we have to do some. We have to. I don't know what the tie break would be. We'd have to play like an online. We'd have to play rugby league live or something, wouldn't we? Yeah, I'm up for that. My dream <laughs> situation, really, is for Australia to lose this and then invite Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, New Zealand, England over to Australia next year for some sort of mini tournament. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And it sounds funny because it's almost like well you're you're basically replaying a World Cup, but yeah. but that that I think this comp you know we do have to play in these games every year and at the same time like if it wasn't a tournament like you look at how like rugby union works they have they play each other every autumn and every summer yeah. they play each other in these like glorified friendlies yeah. and people take them seriously yeah. so I don't know what you know I think we can do that in rugby league too you can have international tournaments while the league's still going on as well. Like team players yeah. would like you could have on a Friday night you could have maybe not a Friday night but on a weekend you could have double headers like at York for example you could have York City Knights versus Featherstone and then you could have England versus France or England versus someone at that level that is really matched up with them like that would be really really interesting to see like, especially in the women's game England versus France is quite a tough one we saw how decent of a game that was uh, earlier this year. Um, when that was played in Warrington, but you have things like that rolled up, and you, you, I know we said, oh, don't package them as things, but if you have a championship game or a League One game on before, you're going to get people watching rug- rugby they might not have seen before as well, so they're going to pick up yeah. the club at the same time. Before we end, actually, I know we usually end on set of six. I just want to mention the fact that this year's summer bash, well, next year's summer bash, 2023 summer bash, is in York, which is really nice, really nice city, fantastic, great to be there in the summer. York have got a home game, an additional home game, which I think is a little bit unfair. But also, mm. it's the same day as the York Braces weekend, Robin. Oh wow, that was a that was a balls up. I didn't realise <laughs> that. Yeah, so I hope you're not going to the York Races that weekend. No, but I mean, like, way to go. There's there's not a massive deal of events in York, but. Like the races, the whole city grinds to a halt when it's the races, and every man and his dogs there. So all those people that would have just been up for a beery weekend and like just yeah. try something different at an event, they're all going to be dressed up and at the races. So yeah, that's a real shame. I I I, I was shocked to see that it's come to York. I think the state, I don't think the stadium's that great to spend two whole days in. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, put anybody off. But, um, <laughs> Like, don't get me wrong, I'm happy it's on my doorstep, but yeah, it's a bit oh, of a, it's a fucking another trick, thing. Man. It's an absolute yeah. trick. Just to, uh, I just want to add to any other business while we're on it, yeah. um, that if anyone hasn't seen the Lee Leopards um, videos <laughs> of South African <laughs> leopard experts proving that it's not a Jaguar on their home kit, then please go and watch it, because honestly, Lee, I like... I don't know what Derek Beaumont is doing, but he is panicking right now. This rebrand is going to ruin his team, and it is brilliant watching his solutions <laughs> yeah. make sure that it doesn't. Yeah, it's mental, isn't it? It's absolutely crazy. Um, also, um, players. there's six players here that haven't got a team for 2023, so um, anyone Seems with money to yeah. spend. Matty Russell, Luke Gale, Sammy Sungi Langi, James Clare, uh, Brad Takarangi and Ryan Hampshire are all out of contract still and haven't got clubs for next year. Brad Takarangi is probably the only one that's prob- is not going to pick up a team due to his off-field issues that he had towards the end of the year. But yeah, um... yeah I think James Clare and Ryan Hampshire might end up at the top of the championship. Yeah, very, very good. And someone like that for Ryan Hampshire would be really nice. Um, Matty Russell, I think, can, will creep into a Super League team who go to pre-season and realise they need a winger. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what happens with Luke Gale, maybe the West Tigers? No, oh, fuck off. <laughs> fuck off. No, 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 no. I don't usually end on a swear, but do one, Toby. Like, don't mind. <laughs> um, no, we'll, yeah, we'll, we've, we've, this has been a really good episode. There's, been, there's, we've, there's stuff we've not even touched on as well uh, that we just haven't had time for. We, I really wanted to get into a bit more of Australia and New Zealand and break those teams down, uh, especially leading up to the finals and stuff. But with everything else going on this week, we just don't have the time. Um, 
join us next week for the final episode of the year. Um, we might do a Christmas special. I've got that in my head. Um, I'll speak to you <laughs> in a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, um, yeah, we'll see you next week. This is, the, this is the, technically the penultimate one of the series. So thank you everyone that's watched, listened, liked, shared, subscribed, commented so far. Um, we'll be at the, the Super League, uh, not Super League Grand Final, Jesus. Um, we'll be at the Rugby League World Cup Final on Saturday. Uh, watch the wheelchair game tomorrow night on BBC. Um, yeah, like, share, subscribe. We've been the Biff. That's been Robin. That's been Toby. I've been Bradley. Brought to you by Swinging Arms and Shoulder Chargers. See you next week.